what is the divine counsel? Now, this is a term that might be unfamiliar to many. It's going to be familiar to others because the term actually comes from the Bible. It comes from Psalm 82, specifically in verse 1, where we read, God has taken his place in the divine counsel. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. If you go down a little ways to verse 6, you get some more information. God is speaking and he says to his counsel, I said, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, with both these verses, there's a little more to them than meets the eye, especially if you're working in English translations. If we go back to Psalm 82, verse 1, we notice that while the translation is good enough, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. God has taken his place in the divine council, first part of the line. But we notice that the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. That's no big deal, again, because we're used to that. Elohim is one of the most common words for God in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament. But what might be a surprise is that in the second half of the verse, we have, in the midst of the gods, he, God, holds judgment. The second occurrence of Elohim is translated gods. So here you have Elohim occurring two times in one passage, two times in one verse, the first time it is translated singularly, properly, because of the grammar, God takes his place in the divine council. And in the second part of the verse, it's translated properly, plural, because of the preposition in the midst of. It can't be in the midst of one entity. And so we have plural. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. If we take a little closer look at verse 6, where God is the speaker and he says to the members of his council, I said, you are gods. There we go again. We see the same word, Elohim. And that's put in parallel to another term, sons of the Most High, the B'nai Elion. Now, this is one of those terms that you'll see in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament, for what might loosely be called angelic beings, other divine beings who are part of the heavenly host. In many cases, many passages, those beings are referred to as the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim or the B'nai Ha Elohim or the B'nai Elim. Here we have B'nai Elyon, sons of the Most High. We know who the Most High is. It's God. So this is a synonymous expression for sons of God, which again is frequently used uh, for divine beings, plural, in the Hebrew Bible. Now, there are other passages that talk about a divine council. Passages like Psalm 89. And there we read, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. Again, there's a little bit more to look at here in this verse as well, specifically in Psalm 89, verse 6. Now, we, get, we again can read very straightforward in English. makes good sense for who in the skies can compare to the Lord, can be compared. And then the next line is, who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Well, notice again, heavenly beings is very obviously one of those stock expression for divine as in plural, divine beings who work with God, who are part of the heavenly host, who are part of the divine council. Who among the heavenly beings, the Hebrew is B'nai Elim, who among the sons of God is like the Lord? Of course, the rhetorical response, the rhetorical answer would be nobody. Now, another passage is 1 Kings 22, specifically verses 19 through 23. But if you're not familiar with the backstory of this passage, in this passage in this chapter, the wicked king of Israel, Ahab, is trying to convince Jehoshaphat to go with him to a battle. And Jehoshaphat would like a word from the Lord, you know, should I go or should I not? And so finally, after listening to the prophets of Ahab, again, the prophets of Baal, essentially, Jehoshaphat says, hey, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh around here? And they summon Micaiah, and Ahab says in the passage, I hate this guy because he never tells me what I want to hear. But nevertheless, Micaiah shows up, and this is what we read in verse 19. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. 
I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. Well, who are these guys? Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he, God, said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. So what we have in 1 Kings 22 is a divine council meeting. We get a glimpse sort of behind the veil as to what's going on in heaven. Now, God has decreed that it's time for Ahab to die. But what we see in 1 Kings 22 is he allows the members of his council, the members of the divine council, to participate in how that decree will be carried out. And you'll notice in the passage that these are not idols. These are not men. The members of the heavenly host, the members of God's council, are spirits. Because verse 21 said, a spirit came forward and had a suggestion. So we're not dealing with you know, something really, really weird like humans reigning with God in the sky, we're dealing with the heavenly host. We're dealing with the divine council. A council that Psalm 82 says are composed of plural Elohim. Another passage is Daniel 7. Now, we're familiar with this one because it's the famous son of man passage in the Old Testament that gets referenced and applied to Jesus when he's on trial before Caiaphas. But if you'll notice in this passage, we read something interesting in verse 9. Here, Daniel 7, verse 9. Daniel says, As I looked, thrones, plural, were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, and his throne was fiery flames. Now, we know who this is. This is God, the fiery throne with the wheels, Daniel goes on to describe. It's the same description as we get in Ezekiel 1, where God is on the throne in Ezekiel's vision. This is God seated, but there are thrones, plural. And we know that it's not just two. The Son of Man isn't seated because the Son of Man will come to the Ancient of Days and then receive everlasting dominion. Later in the passage, we actually read that the court sat and, again, helped God to render judgment. So the divine council, again, participates in what's going on with God's decrees. So that's a brief overview of what in the world is this thing called the divine council? Again, in more familiar language, it's the heavenly host. But we need to pay attention to what's going on in Psalm 82.1, where the academic term really comes from. Psalm 82, verse 1, God, Elohim, takes his place in the divine council, and in the midst of the gods, in the midst of El the Elohim, plural, he passes judgment, he renders judgment. Now, that raises all sorts of questions in the minds of a lot of people. So next time we get together, we're going to ask this question and, of course, answer it. Are the gods, the Elohim of the divine council, just humans? Now, I've already alluded to where I'm at on that question. The answer is going to be no. But you would be amazed at how many times you will read that in commentaries, especially New Testament commentaries when you get to John 10, because... Jesus quotes Psalm 82 in one of those scenes in John 10. And every commentary on the Gospel of John I have ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them, says that the gods of Psalm 82, they're, they're just people. They're just people. They might give you the other views, but they're just people. Nothing to see here, citizens. Nothing unusual going on. Well, that just isn't the case. And next time, we'll consider that question. But in the meantime, I hope that you will Get my book, The Unseen Realm. It's available on Amazon and in other outlets, as well as patronize the Naked Bible podcast. Of course, we want you to listen to it, but this is a means to support uh, the creation of content on my website. So the Naked Bible podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com. And of course, you can read the Naked Bible blog on my website. And then lastly, I hope that you'll take advantage of my three new books, the 60 Second Scholar Series, where we get into some of this information for lay people, but also techniques and strategies and just good old-fashioned advice on how to study the scriptures.